Welcome to this special program sponsored by the Institute of Noetic Sciences. I'm Marilyn Schlitz, Vice President for Science and Education. The Institute of Noetic Sciences, founded in 1973 by Apollo astronaut Edgar Mitchell, investigates consciousness, mind and spirit, and the relationship of consciousness in the physical world. Through frontier sciences, transformative education, and learning communities, our programs and inquiries are guided by our vision of global wisdom for the 21st century. Edgar Mitchell, one of my heroes, was one of the people who participated in the journey on the Apollo 14 space mission. Looking out of the window at planet Earth, suspended in the vast void of deep space, Edgar Mitchell, trained as an MIT engineer and who understood as well as anyone the importance and power of mastering the physical world, had an epiphany, a moment of awe and wonder. He was aware that each of us is embedded in our own story, often grounded in deep divisions based on personal or nationalistic boundaries. But from the perspective of outer space, none of these divisions that we take for granted made any sense at all. By changing perspective, we can literally change our worldview. And in this process, we may begin to create a new model of reality one which deconstructs our emphasis solely on the physical and begins to embrace a broader scope of possibility, namely the significance of consciousness. Since the founding of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, we've been addressing some of the most fundamental questions. What does it mean to be human? What is our place in the universe? And if, in fact, consciousness can cause changes in the physical world, what are the implications of this as we seek to create a more just, compassionate, and sustainable future? The Institute of Noetic Sciences is an international community of more than 50,000 members and friends who are empowered both individually and collectively to ask the deepest questions and to begin to synthesize different worldviews and belief systems. Members keep in touch with the latest research in consciousness and healing through our rich and varied publications and programs and through our online chats, discussions, and private community website. Your membership benefits include a subscription to our beautiful and literary quarterly journal, The Ions Review. Members also have the opportunity to receive our monthly e-newsletter, The iConnect. Be sure to visit our website at www.noetic.org and register your current email address online so that we can keep you posted with the latest news and discounts on seminars and events, books and CDs. You can also participate in Noetic Dialogue with other IONS members in over 250 community groups worldwide. IONS sponsors regional meetings, on-site retreats, internet conversations, and outreach through strategic partners, educational programs, and international conferences. You're invited to come with us on our travel programs, which integrate both the inner and outer journey. Our retreat center offers another way to participate in the noetic community. In addition to our own on-site retreats, we make our facilities available to interested outside groups. Large and spacious carpeted meeting halls and dormitory chalets offer participants a chance to immerse themselves in study and relaxation on our 200-acre campus. You can also learn about our state-of-the-art psychophysiology laboratory designed to examine such phenomena as distant healing, mind-body medicine, subtle energies, and states of consciousness. We put together this research video to give you a peek into some interesting areas of research going on today. What you're about to see are highlights from a series of research meetings held on the IONS campus in 2002 and 2003.
In this program, we're exploring the role of mind and matter from the vantage point of psi research. This is the area of study that focuses on such reported phenomena as telepathy, mind-to-mind -mind communication, clairvoyance, mind-to-object or event communication, precognition, the knowledge of the future, as well as psychokinesis, or mind over matter. Thousands of experiments have been done to address the question, are these phenomena real? As in other areas of science, there are disagreements over how to interpret the data. But the fact remains that most scientists, including skeptics, who have seriously studied the evidence, now agree that something significant is going on. The presenters you're about to see are world-renowned experts in their field. They include Dr. Daryl Bem, professor of psychology at Cornell University, Dr. Ed May, nuclear physicist and renowned psi researcher, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, astronaut and founder of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Dr. Dean Radin, senior scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Dr. Marilyn Schlitz, vice president for science and education at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Dr. Leanna Standish, senior research scientist at Bastyr University. Russell Targ, physicist and retired senior scientist at Lockheed. And Dr. Jessica Utz, Professor of Statistics at the University of California, Davis. The speakers will be sharing with you different ways in which psi research is done in the laboratory. As they describe their experiments and reveal their findings, we'll learn ways to distinguish between magic tricks, random coincidence, and genuine psi phenomena. The reason that I believe that we should be interested in psychic abilities is that it offers us an opportunity to discover who we are. You can certainly use psychic abilities to invest in the stock market and find your car keys and do all the other various interesting things that uh, psychic abilities allow you to do. But the thing that they uniquely allow you to do is not looking outside at the rings of Saturn, but looking inside at your core and coming in contact with your own flow of loving awareness which defines who you are. How do we maintain a healthy skepticism while still remaining open to the possibility of psi phenomena? I selected Kathleen for this because she was sitting next to me <laughs> last night. Here? Yeah, that's right. Um, stay here, stay here. You're, you're part of this. Okay. Um, and the other reason I asked her is because she lives in the local area so she could prepare the materials at home rather than in the dormitory where she would have access to more things and materials and more unusual things. So you were asked to go home and pick how many items did you pick? Four. Four items. And I, did I guide you in any way? What to, yes, I did. I said pick them, make them unusual. Okay. Now, I mean, the, see, that's the problem. You have to be careful here. Okay. Uh, you were asked also that you be alone when you selected them, mm -hmm. and you have a family. Mm -hmm. No one in the family knows what they are? Correct. Okay. And you were to bring them here, but keep this, it's in a box within the bag, mm -hmm. you, to keep that in your possession. Has it been in your possession the whole time? The whole time. Okay. And you were not to tell anyone here what the items are? That's correct. Okay. Um, and do you have them memorized so you don't have to look in the box yourself? Yes. Okay. So can you essentially affirm for everybody here that there's no way in which anyone in this room has knowing what those are unless they're, they have psi? That's right. Okay. What I, do you have them memorized in any particular order? Any order. Okay. I'd like you to pick one and think about it. Okay. Okay. Move to another one. Okay. The third one. And you said there are four, right? Mm -hmm. I have a terrible memory. Okay. Um, do you have the fourth one in mind? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, let me tell you what I've picked up first. I've picked up two things. One reminds me of the object that Russell brought yesterday. Not that it's Asian or religious, but that it's, it seems like it's brass or gold and hard metal. Is that one of the items? I mean, is that similar to one of the items? Um. For the first item? Or I don't care. I, that's, I'm just p telling you what I've picked up. Is there an item that is brass or gold mm -hmm. and metallic? Okay. 
it also looks not like a, something round, but rather a tower of some sort. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now you're actually sending me a, a sort of a, a, what I'm picking up here is, is a verbal message. Is it a, a statue of the Eiffel Tower? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, <laughs> good. All right. Uh, let's, the other thing I picked up is, struck me at first as if it were something alive, but I think it was something that was alive at some time. Is that correct? Something organic, mm -hmm. uh, fossil of some sort? Mm -hmm. I don't say yes if it isn't true. Okay. Is it some kind of sea fossil? Mm -hmm. um, it looks to me sort of like a crab of some sort. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know what you would call them. Why don't you tell me what it is? Yeah, you can tell me. That's as it's far as... It's a sand dollar. Sand dollar. Okay, I'm not familiar with that term. And what is it? Seashell. Seashell. Oh, oh, okay. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know whether that's a miss or a hit. You got it? Okay, okay. Um, I also picked up... This is interesting because it also came up yesterday uh, and that no one thought of it. Uh, and that is I pick up a fuzzy creature like a beanie baby or something. Is there a beanie baby in there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and that's a low probability one for this group. Um, the only other thing, I didn't pick up anything but the color, and all that flashed through my mind was pink. Okay, I, I don't know, what, what is it? Why don't we take a look? Okay. You've sealed it? What, what is it? Why don't you tell us? Um, it's just a statue. Oh, okay. There's our beanie baby, presumably. Oh, oh, here it is. Okay, yeah, I didn't pick up the shape or even the material on that. Here's our... Okay, and I think what I was picking up on the sand dollar was actually the picture inside. My goodness. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. I belong to what's called the Psychic Entertainers Association. And this is what we do, not for our day job, but <laughs> this, is, this is what we do. And one reason I got into parapsychology, because Chuck Onerton happened to see me do this kind of a performance at the parapsychology meeting in 1978 in Boston. I think it was 78. And he came to me and said, I'm about to begin a Gonsfeld series. Would you come to the lab, look at it as a social psychologist who does experiments, and as a magician to see whether anyone could cheat? Now, aside from radio contact, which seemed very unlikely, I said, no, if you get positive results with this, this paradigm, that Gonsfeld, uh, I would be willing to use my other talent and get us published in a mainstream journal. And that's what happened in 1994. And in the footnote to that, we announced that I was, uh, am a member of the Psychic Entertainers Association. And the president of the Psychic Entertainers Association also came to the lab to vouch that you couldn't do the kinds of things I did here. The moral of the story is, as soon as you relax the controls at all, as soon as you violate any of the, of the controls that we so insist on and that my colleagues in psychology insist on, it's possible to produce something that looks like psi that is not. And my mission as life is to make my colleagues more open-minded, not with this, but with the data, to make my mo colleagues more open-minded to what you now take for granted and to take what you take for granted and make you a little bit more skeptical of anecdotal reports. Seemingly psychic phenomena can be analyzed using common sense and simple probability theory. Why do we need statistics, you might ask? Because all measurements, especially those involving living systems, are highly variable. We need rigorous mathematical methods for distinguishing between genuine signal and just plain noise. If we're going to talk about coincidences, we have to realize that there are, I don't know what the latest census figures on and how many millions there are in the United States, but it's probably over 300 are we up to 280 million or three? 280 million? Okay. So let's say something has a one in a million chance of happening. How many people should it happen to in the United States every day? If it has a one in a million chance of happening on a particular day? 280, right? <laughs> so even a one in a million coincidence should happen to 280 people a day. So, uh, so Often when you see stories about coincidences, the wrong question is being asked. The question that's asked is, what's the probability of exactly that event happening? Whereas we should be saying, what's the probability of something like that happening sometime, somewhere, to somebody? Okay. 
It's like winning the lottery twice. I was on a TV talk show with this guy who'd won the lottery twice. And um, I did some calculations and I explained that the probability of this happening was virtually certain um, once in every seven years of somebody somewhere winning it twice. And he got all excited and he said, yeah, it was seven years in between the two. <laughs> it was perfect. He played right into it. Of course, statistics aren't always the way in which people formulate their views of psi phenomena. It's a person's beliefs about how the world works that inform their interpretation of direct experience. As the global worldview changes, so do our perceptions. How often do we laugh at the way people thought, even 30 years ago? Let me show you, the, give you a taste of the culture I come from. Um, if you ask in a Gallup poll, do you believe in ESP? And people have different, different meanings of what they mean by that, because you get some crazy responses. I do believe in telepathy, but I don't believe in ESP. And so you, you, it's clear people don't fully understand the question. But generally, the American public, about 50%, in a Gallup poll say yes to the question, do you believe in ESP? If you look at people with a college education, it's two-thirds. And that's often a surprise to my colleagues, that college education makes you more open to the possibility. Uh, so it isn't just the dummies out there who didn't go to college who think this. In fact, college-educated people are more likely. Well, there's a, a poll of 1,100 college professors in the United States and Canada that asked them a slightly more refined way, do you believe that ESP is uh, demonstrated, do you believe it's likely, you don't know, you believe it's unlikely, or you think it's impossible, okay? So what, I've, uh, what I will show you are the data for is ESP is either established or likely, in other words, the top two. And the, uh, across all the professors, the answer was 66% said yes to, to one of those two, which is virtually identical to the college-educated public, okay? But if you break it down by field, it goes like this. 55% of physical scientists, the physicists, the chemists, the biologists, say yes to do you think ESP is established or likely. Social scientists, not counting psychologists, 66%. And then the old softies over in arts, humanities, and education, 77%. <laughs> Most of you people. Um, and then there's my colleagues, 34%. So my belief that Psy has been established is clearly a minority position among my colleagues. But it's a sizable minority. Yes. But let me show you the other end of the scale. <laughs> if you ask, is ESP impossible, which is the other end of the scale, 2% of all non-psychologists say that they think it's impossible. But a 30, another 34% of psychologists say it's impossible. Now, they don't know the history of science because you never say that about anything. I mean, uh, the, if they knew their history of science, in the 18th century, many scientists did not believe in meteorites. And any time someone reported one, they would come up with some explanation. Maybe kids were throwing stones. Uh, maybe it was a volcano somewhere. Um, and you can tell by the way the, the question was phrased why there was so much skepticism. Thomas Jefferson, by the way, entered this fray. He hired, uh, consulted Yale, psychology, or Yale scientists to go out and pursue the, the answer to the question, why is God hurling stones at us from the sky? <laughs> now, what's interesting about that is notice how it is framed. It assumes a certain kind of universe and how it works. And what I find interesting about the history of science here is the quality of the evidence for meteorites has not changed. And yet now every child who's ever been to a museum of natural history believes in meteorites. Um, what has changed is our view of how the universe works. And I think there's a moral in that. I think just accumulating more and more data will not, will not finally ultimately convince the skeptics. What needs to change is their view of how the world might work. And maybe the quantum world or the, that view of, of the world will eventually become more publicly known. Uh, but the Newtonian world we live in is not likely to be able to embrace the phenomena we're interested in. There are many promising new directions for research on psi phenomena. The area of healing, for example, is growing in importance and speaks to the relevance of psi research. The other thing that many of you are interested in 
is distant healing, distant mental influence. In distant mental influence, you outflow your healing intention. If you have a sick person or a person in pain, you have the opportunity to outflow your good wishes for them. And the evidence is quite strong now that from published data that you are able to affect the, the health and the feelings of a distant person. And I'll be talking about that later, later on. Uh, Marilyn was strongly involved in a decade of work with William Broad in distant mental influence, showing that as a sender can quiet her mind and watch someone on closed circuit television, her mental state can have an effect on the physiology of the distant person. Similarly, in work that my daughter Elizabeth Targ did at California Pacific Medical Center. Elizabeth was a psychiatrist. And what she showed is that healers across the country could affect the outcome or the medical condition of men suffering with AIDS in San Francisco. In her work involving a total of 60 men, 30 of them were controls and 30 of them were in a prayer group prayed for group, and what she showed and published is that the men who were the recipient of prayerful intention had general overall health, they had fewer trips to the doctor, they had fewer opportunistic illnesses, fewer days in the hospital, and a generally better self-report. Now, of course, all the men wished to be in the healing group, but they were ignorant, they were blind as to whether or not they were in the prayed for group or in the control group. But it was strongly significant at the end of the experiment that the people who were the recipient of the prayers, the people whose pictures were looked at and prayed for, the 30 people whose pictures were looked at and prayed for by the healers, they had much better outcomes than the people who received no prayers. A good, a good case history here is acupuncture. You know, Western medicine refused to accept it, and partly because of the, the, what they consider the baggage it came with. Um, and so the very good evidence, for example, that acupuncture helped cocaine and heroin addicts uh, with what withdrawal symptoms seemed nonsensical until it was shown that acupuncture produces the production of endorphins in the brain. Well, now suddenly there's a mechanism, so now acupuncture is far more respectable. Uh, you, not quite, you think. <laughs> But many more physicians who would never have even considered it, once you have sort of a bridge between what they know and what you're trying to show them, it's more plausible. Even more is just the notion that the mind can affect your body. Your mind, locally, can affect your body. Because until it was found that stress produces a change in the neurotransmitters, and hence the immune system, once the immune system got involved, then suddenly, of course, the brain affects the, the body. Uh, and yet that was rejected within my lifetime and certainly yours. So a materialistic science is much more accepting, not because of the data itself, but if you have a plausible mechanism. Um, and, and, but we certainly will make use of a technology long before we understand why it works. And medicine is the perfect example of that. But, but it was very important that you discover that stress can affect the immune system because that made the materialistic contact between uh, healing yourself. Now, distant healing is still off in the left field for, for anyone with a materialistic view. Okay. So what we did is we invited volunteers to come in, the receiver then, and we would monitor their physiology using electrodes on the palm of their hand. We would invite a healer to come in and attempt to influence the physiology of the distant person. And then the experimenter's job was to try and maintain the system and make sure that all the random processes were working according to plan. So all this will become a little more obvious as we move along. This is Stefan Schmidt. He's a colleague from uh, Freiburg, Germany. And Stefan is somebody who really has, more than anyone else, <coughs> taken a critical look at this particular database. 
What we're doing is putting sensors on our hand and monitoring this through our physiological recording equipment. Meanwhile, a healer or a psychic or an unselected person, somebody interested and motivated, is in another room attempting to influence the physiology from a distance. Okay, and so what in this particular testing paradigm you get is during the sending periods, you'll see the image of the subject or the receiver on the screen. And so her job during these sending periods is to try and increase the autonomic activity of the distant person, okay? And then do nothing during the control periods. And in this way, we can look at differences in the autonomic activity in those two sets of conditions. And so this is in a, a good DMIL session, this is the kind of data that we're looking for. And in this particular session, you're seeing that there's a highly statistically significant difference in the autonomic nervous system activity under these two sets of conditions. And what we're finding out of these experiments, um, conducted in a number of different places, as I mentioned, the Mind Science Foundation, where we developed the protocol, um, University of Edinburgh in Scotland, uh, University of Las Vegas, uh, Science Applications, University of Hertfordshire, and now the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And what we're seeing here is that overall, there are 36 studies now reported, 30 of them positive, 6 negative. It would certainly appear that there's some kind of effect. If you do a meta-analysis or a concatenation of the data across the various experiments, what you end up with is a, um, an effect at about 0.3 which is a, a reasonably robust effect. And uh, the IONS lab so far is producing an effect that is comparable, not significantly different, from what we're finding in the overall database, and it is statistically significant. Just quickly, what are some of the alternative explanations that could explain away these data? Uh, we could say that it's recording mistakes. Uh, what we try to do is be very systematic. Everything is recorded. Uh, we, we've done it under very rigorous conditions. Uh, randomization problems. We make sure that our sources of randomness are um, true. We double check afterward to make sure that the random sequence was right. Um, sensory leakage. This is one of the reasons that we invested in a two-ton electromagnetically shielded room in our laboratory across the way is because we want to work with skeptics. We want to work with people who hold different views than ourselves because it is at that interface of the exchange between these different viewpoints that new ideas are going to come out. Well, the path in remote viewing is one of quieting your mind and expanding your awareness into the universe. In remote viewing, we do formal double-blind experiments to show for a fact that you can quiet your mind and see what's happening thousands of miles away or out into the solar system. We did experiments with Ingo Swan where he described uh, interplanetary objects that were not known at the time. So as far as we know, there is no limit in space or time to what your awareness has contact with. And this is totally coherent with the wisdom teachings from thousands of years ago. We had to do remote viewing at uh, 12 midnight on that date, or, you know, in the morning, and uh, every eight hour intervals until the next uh, midnight. And all Joe had to do was just describe the environment in which this person, whose social security number we had, was hiding at. That was the only, you know, it seems magical, actually. And so um, at 8 in the morning of that day, um, our target person was actually hiding in this building at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. It's called Building A. And what Joe described, although you can't see it here, he drew a building that was almost exactly the correct shape, even labeled it Building A, and it has the right mm -hmm. number of floors yes. on it. And he also said there's a lab complex, and there's a lab complex. There's a parking lot, and there's a parking lot, and there's some trees, and there's some trees. There's a road, and there's a road. I flew over Livermore, and as Russ said, took this picture to flatter that data, but it definitely was not necessary. That was the 8 o'clock in the morning remote viewing, and it just nailed where this guy was, who was in Building A planning the evening's experiment. At four that day, our fellow was in the car driving through uh, out to site A300 at Livermore where the experiment was actually going to take place, and his driving took him through um, 
uh, this area. I think, Russ, you were with me when I took yes. that picture. We went out and took this <coughs> picture, again, to flatter this data, but it's not necessary. And what you can't see here is Joe said, this is uh, um, electricity in the form of a grid, uh, halos that you can't see. And I don't remember what the rest of it says. On my graphs, they're, they're explained. And uh, that's exactly right. It's easy to understand how our bodies would react strongly to a loud and startling noise. But this next experiment examines what happens unconsciously before a stimulus occurs. So what does the data actually look like? This is the collection of 125 people, all their data averaged together. Here is where the stimulus decision actually occurred. That's when we went out and flipped the coin, OK? And so here's one second after, two after, and so on, five after. Here's one before, two before, and three before. And this is what psychophysiologists look at all the time. If you said to a normal psychophysiologist, well, why don't we look in the pre-stimulus region, and he'd say, or he or she would say, why would you bother doing that? There's nothing there. Look at that. So no, it, the mainstream psychophysiologist looking at this data, which they do all the time, would never, ever be motivated, including me, to bother looking at what's going on there. All right? We're now going to look at the exact same data, except we're going to expand this scale. Instead of two, it's going to be almost 100 times more sensitive. And when you do that, that pre-stimulus region gets very interesting indeed. Here, uh, I've, only, I've cut off the, the post-stimulus response. So this is one second before the decision, two and three before the decision, one and one and a half after. And you notice this thing's taking off. <laughs> and if I plotted it, it would be uh, you know, halfway to the moon. So this is a very exquisite, tiny effect, but it is there. This is the skin conductance before people eventually heard sound, even though it hadn't even been decided upon by the computer yet. And this is the skin conductance before people eventually heard nothing even though that hadn't been decided upon. And the area difference here turns out to be enormously significant and interesting. This next section shows a series of potentially breakthrough experiments involving sophisticated brain imaging technology and what's described as distant neural energy transfer. I was raised in the scientific materialistic tradition. Um, I embraced it very strongly and the whole uh, my whole experience over like really the last 25 years has been the cracking away of that. And I'm finally, I think, there where I can't, if these data are true, then the way that we go about doing brain research um, in the conventional setting is, is really quite inadequate. But I think most people in this room think that we're probably interconnected in some way beyond what we normally think when we're growing up. But you would say, well, you know, that effect, if it were just like a light bulb, would diminish as a function of distance. You know, the brightness of the signal and the latency of the signal increases as the people get further and further away. And what, uh, what Goswami said to me is, no, the signal doesn't diminish as a function of distance. And that's why this paper argued that this phenomena of seeing EEG signals transfer between brains at a distance, two brains at a distance, was the first neurophysiological evidence of non-local consciousness. I'm going to go through two kinds of experiments, electroencephalographic or EEG experiments and functional MRI imaging experiments. The conclusion goes like this. There is evidence of signal transduction between human brains at a distance using both EEG and functional MRI technology. This is the setup. We have three adjacent rooms that are 100 feet in length. Um, the two people's brains are separated by 30 feet. The control room here is in the center. So here's, here's uh, uh, the sender's brain. Here's the receiver's brain. Here's a room in between with the control apparatus. Um, and we've got a visual stimulus screen here that the sender is looking at. And then just to make sure that there isn't something funny about the room or the electronics uh, configuration, will alternate randomly between um, the, sometimes the sender is in this room and sometimes the receiver is in this room. So the, the room looks like this. Um, they are not electrically isolated. We made a, a strategic decision to not isolate when we're looking because if you want to look for a signal, you don't want to do anything that might stop the signal from getting through. So we didn't do that. 
And then here's the other person in the other room 30 feet away. And this is the checkerboard stimulus. And if you, it's, this is a very, this is standard uh, kind of stimulus that's used in clinical neurophysiology to find out if the visual system works properly. Now the next experiment was funded by uh, the Chopra Center for Well-Being and the instant, a grant from the Institute of Noetic Sciences. We use a different meditation technique. Uh, the one that is taught by Deepak Chopra and his group is called primordial sound meditation. And it seemed like a really good candidate to uh, increase the probability of seeing a signal if a signal exists. And the goals of the second experiment were to replicate the first experiment with a better design and to refine the clarity of the signal by recruiting experienced meditators who'd been trained in this special kind of meditation. This is what amazed me. This is my brain. Um, this is the looking from the side, like this kind of a view through the midline. Back here is visual cortex. This is the nose. And right here you see a spot that has lit up. It is an area 18 and 19 of visual cortex. And that spot was generated by a computer that, that took all of the stimuli, the, all the activity in the brain that was occurring during the, the uh, static condition and subtract that. And what you see left over is a signal right there. And you can see, now this is a cut through this, this way. And you're looking now, this is visual cortex here. Uh, this is the thalamus. This is the frontal cortex. And you see a little signal there. Now, I, um, this actually impressed me quite a bit. Um, because I'd never seen anything like that. And the probability of getting these results by chance would be less than 0.000073. Um, and then we looked at Clark, then Clark and I changed positions. And um, we don't see a signal in his brain, and we actually thought that was, oh, that's good. All right? If this is an intermittent thing, and not everybody does it all the time, then it was, for me, a confirmation that it wasn't some kind of artifact of this complicated computer programming. Then, um, I didn't believe this. I said, oh, no, this can't be true. So then we brought in the uh, pair of subjects, the only pair of subjects who had replicated in the EEG study. Okay, remember? It was one pair. And we brought them into the fMRI lab. This is uh, subject CW. CW and DW, the next uh, person, are young. They're in their 20s. Uh, a man and a woman, they live together, they're best friends, they're medical students, they meditate together, um, they, they're close, they're not married. Um, but anyway, so the first experiment was CW, don't really see anything. And then we gave them another chance, and there it is. And once again, in visual cortex, area 18 and 19. Identical to where it was seen in my brain. So then, oh, this is, this is maybe something. Now. DW is in the uh, MRI, and you see a very nice signal once again in visual cortex. I really now believe that there is a signal. I think we've, de we've developed a sensitive signal detection method for this work, and if valid, allows us um, in a laboratory, uh, laboratory setting to answer all kinds of questions, the kind of questions I'm particularly interested in are what is the nature of the signal? Is it electromagnetic? Um, is it non-local? Yes, sir. I have uh, three quick uh, comments, uh, neutral, good, and bad news. <laughs> the neutral one is uh, your assumption of instantaneous transmission is not bad because Zoli in Hungary had actually direct measure of that with that model that he was doing and found no time slippage beyond the expected uh, latencies. So that's not a bad assumption. Uh, the good news is, is what I would call a pre-replication. I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, David Gallen and Ornstein at uh, Langley Porter in the 70s with Russ Targ and myself did exactly that experiment you've just done with uh, 10 hertz flick uh, 16 hertz flickering light. That's the good news. The bad news is, is we saw change, significant changes in alpha when we took the sender away. So my challenge to you is, how are you, do you know this is a neural energy transfer system as opposed to what classical parapsychologists would call simply observing an evoked response from a clairvoyant circumstance? Lose the sender.
Mm-hmm. Well, that's right. I mean, the next place to go, one of the next places, is yeah. to get rid of the sender entirely. I'm willing to bank your bet on that one, by the way. You, you are? Yeah. <laughs> you don't think a sender is required? Uh, I have done experiments and funded them elsewhere because when we were back in the cold days, of the bad old days of the Cold War spying on the Russians, we wanted to know whether a sender, witting or unwitting, was necessary. So we spent a lot of effort determining whether, at least in remote viewing, whether a sender was necessary, and the answer is no, if the receiver is blind. Wow. All right, well, we'll do that. $50,000 in the bed. She needs $50,000 to make a project. Work on this. <laughs> it's a great experiment, by the way. Excellent. You're doing it. Yes, sir. So, uh, Leanna, you just asked whether or not signal might be the most appropriate term for the uh, phenomenon that you're investigating, or perhaps the word field might be more appropriate. And um, I think that's a very good question, but I suggest that perhaps it's neither field nor signal, that's um, the phenomenon that you're investigating, that those two words actually uh, refer to physical phenomena. And the one thing we know about consciousness is that it's non-physical. And therefore, using terminology borrowed from physics probably is not the most appropriate way of trying to explain or understand what's going on with consciousness. Um, so I would suggest that one of the questions that perhaps a group like this would want to ask is, whether or not we are making a mistake if we try to think of consciousness as a form of energy, that perhaps consciousness has got less to do with mechanism. In fact, I suggest, I suspect, it's got nothing to do with mechanism and has everything to do with meaning. One of the greatest questions facing psi researchers has to do with the limits of consciousness. Is it isolated in the brains of individuals? Or is there something like a collective field of consciousness? In the Global Consciousness Program, Dr. Roger Nelson and Dr. Dean Radin have developed a global network of random generators, essentially electronic coin flippers that produce a random series of numbers. They're evaluating the degree to which these generators respond to events that attract mass attention. That is the random number generator that I have attached to the computer right now. Its job in life is to produce random bits. It does it at about 960 per second, and that's all it knows how to do, and it likes doing it. <laughs> and when it's, when it's working nicely, if you simply add up the number of ones, say, over time, you will get a classic random walk. It'll, it'll deviate around a zero point very nicely. This is a picture of a tsunami warning system. And the way it works is that on the Pacific Ocean, there are the bu uh, buoys dropped every so often, and what they, the, um, the oceanographic institutes around the Pacific Rim monitor the buoy heights and the buoy motions. Because when a tsunami occurs, a tsunami could occur if a meteorite hits the water or a big landmass hits the water, it creates a wave the size of the entire ocean. And if you happen to be on it, it's OK. Just, you know, you'll go up 20 or 30 feet, and you'll come down, and it's OK. But when it hits the, wa hits the land, it could turn into a, like a 300-foot wave and completely destroy a whole area. So people want to have a warning system when these events occur. Well, what's happening? The reason, the way that they do it is if it turns out that a whole bunch of buoys show the same motion at the same time, one way of thinking of it is that they are intercorrelated. Their motions are intercorrelated. And that is then a way of saying that something big is happening because normally each buoy is sort of random. So think of this now as a random network is a bunch of buoys, but it's the ocean of consciousness and not the ocean of the ocean. And we look for the intercorrelations between all pairs of, of random generators. And so if all of those generators start acting the same way, even though they're thousands of miles apart, we get a sense that the equivalent of a tsunami is coming in. So here's September 11th. Now this, unfortunately, is a, is a test case for, for this looking at whether the world is responding. So on September 11th, we have overall statistical effect that was be beyond positive three and then about eight hours later beyond negative three. And that's a, it's a dramatic, I mean just visually you can see that it looks like something happened. The question is how often does that happen by chance? And so we, we looked at that. It's a six and a half standard deviation drop. So if you think about this in terms of the bell curve, it's as though you're way out on one side of the bell and then you slam over to the other side of the bell over the course of eight hours. But the peak occurred at 6 a.m. And as you remember, the events actually began to unfold at 8.30. So does that mean it's a premonition? And I'm asked this all the time. And again, if it's a friendly audience, I'll say, yes, it looks like a premonition to me. 
if it's not a friendly audience, I'll say, I don't know what that is. And realistically, I, re I don't know what it is, obviously, but it, you know, we see it occasionally for large-scale events like earthquakes that as though something in the world is preparing to, to get a big shock. What does it mean? Well, at, at minimum, it means something like that. Mind and matter are perhaps complementary, not simply interacting as though it was dualistic, but two sides of the same coin. Uh, we think of maybe the mind-matter interaction uh, in Aristotelian terms as matter causing mind, matter influencing mind. That's what Aristotle would have called an efficient cause. And that's what most science thinks of when it thinks about causation in general, that the, the matter produced something, the neurons firing produced my mind, and so on. But Aristotle would have said there's also a final cause, that mind thinking things causes matter to move just as well. And if those two are really complementary, then the, some of this begins to make more sense. So one big implication is that some coincidences may be meaningful examples of final cause, and not just chance. And another implication is that collective mind may influence everything. We're talking about a big feedback cycle here, where uh, the, uh, the matter is clearly influencing minds to some degree. A great challenge that faces psi researchers is simply, how does it work? Attempts by physicists to address this question often lead into the complex and fascinating realm of quantum physics and the science of non-locality. If I were a physicist just at Columbia University doing graduate physics, I would probably be investigating non-locality. So it's important that you know that this is not something that comes from Buddhism or theosophy or some obscure metaphysical principle. The idea of non-locality is the hot idea in modern physics today. And what it says is that things that are strongly separated, as separated as they can be in physics, nonetheless can be connected to one another. In the data of remote viewing, if you only remember one thing that I tell you about remote viewing and psychic ability, is the idea that these abilities are non-local. It is no harder to sit in the laboratory in Petaluma. It's, it's no harder to describe what's going on in the Soviet Union than it is to describe what's going on across the campus. Distance does not degrade psychic functioning at all. And that's an experiment that has been done countless times over a century of research. We all understand uh, the physicists, I mean the doctors and the chemists and the physicists have been telling us for a long time that what makes up our living systems are primarily carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, those basic elements that we know make up life. But it's the same elements that make that up that make us up. And that's not alive and we are alive. And <clears throat> I want to point out, and some of you may know, or let's maybe not remember, there's a, been a famous experiment some 45 years ago, the Uri Miller experiment, in which certain ingredients were put into a presumed early planetary environment, allowed to set, and an electrical impulse run through it, and sure enough, they self-organized into the amino acids that are a building block of life. So, the chemicals are the same, but there's something different going on when it becomes living system. And it's appearing that that difference has to do with the quantum properties of nature. Quantum properties pertain to everything in the universe. Our scale size on up to cosmic scale size. And the quantum holographic work that my colleagues in Europe have been doing is simply an expression of that. And that the information base, information base at the quantum level is nature's fundamental information system. Until biochemists and medical people 
start to get themselves educated into quantum principles, they're not going to understand these things we're talking about. It's a new door that has got to be opened before we really start to understand life, consciousness, all of these interconnections. When I came back from space and first heard James Lovelock's concepts of Gaia, I said, yeah, but the whole universe is like that. <laughs> that is exactly the point. That it is not just Earth, it is, it is Earth. It is all systems are integrated and in some sense coherent, tightly coupled information energy systems. And we're just now coming to start to understand that. look in on a discussion at the end of a conference in which the panel addressed the provocative question, can Psi be learned? What we found is that a very wide variety of high-level government scientists right up to the Under Secretary of Defense could learn to be psychic. That we would have one level of CIA people who would person to come to the lab wanting to see something psychic and we would show him how to do remote viewing, and he would do excellently. And I've published some of these studies. He would then go back to Washington, and his boss would call me the next day and say that Joe was out here. He, Joe came to California for three days, and after three days, he thinks he's a psychic. Uh, I, wa I, wanna I wanna come out and see what you people are doing. And then we would show her how to do the same thing. So my impression is, that most people can learn to do surprisingly uh, successful remote viewing. And by way of learning, you don't learn to become more psychic, but to some degree, in the workshops that Jane and I do, for example, uh, people do better at the end than in the beginning because it's as though we learn what we're able to teach them how to recognize the images that have psychic content, that we can give them some guidance uh, how to, it's an intellectual ability. You learn to separate the psychic signals from the mental noise. So it's as though we, you, you put a bicycle in front of them and they'll kind of wobble around and we can actually teach them how to ride that bicycle. We get asked that question a lot, and especially in the light of the internet and uh, uh, training uh, programs are there by the dozens with lots of money attached to them. And uh, I would agree with Russ up to a point that you can, in fact, take somebody who's never thought about this much before and in an evening or 20 minutes uh, instruct them on how best to perform to whatever their capacity actually is. Having done that, uh, there is an enormous amount of evidence. Uh, you know, I'm, I have the records dating back from 1972 to 1995, and in one of those cases, one person has produced remote viewing throughout that entire time frame, including different modalities to try to learn to teach it and, and improve. And the, and the good news is they didn't get any worse from the day they walked into the lab. The very bad news is that no one in this group of people has shown positive incline and in learning. So, in my own view, I don't think it can be taught beyond what Russ has mentioned. Some pointers um, and so on. Um, so that's what the data says to me. Somebody else want to make a comment? I, I would just add that, that uh, Ed's data is confounded a little bit by starting with people with extremely high natural talent. No. And no. Like Hella Hammond walks in the door, didn't think she had. But, but, she, but she was an extremely high natural talent. Okay. And it's true that she didn't get any better, but there's a plateau effect where you, if you start at a certain range, you, you okay. just, there's no place else to go. <laughs> so I think uh, what, uh, I, I agree with Ed, Ed and Russ on this, and that uh, basically we're probably, be, probably dealing with something like a normal curve of talent. And so some people have a natural, very high talent. They don't need to study very much. They get very good very quickly, but then they don't get much better because you can't go beyond that. Whereas the people on the other side who are very bad natural untalents, and they can try all day and they're never going to get anywhere. Fortunately, most of us are in that middle portion and we, we can learn tips and tricks and get better. 
can you learn it? I, my thought was, well, you don't want to teach psi. Maybe you want to teach meditation, or maybe you want to take everyone on a retreat, uh, because that's still in the scientific spirit. You can then say, what are the consequences of that? And so I, I don't know what it would be like to teach people meditation. We know meditators do better in laboratory studies. Um, so maybe that's the thing to train. I'm interested in the transformation of consciousness. I'm just going about it in a very different way than Jane is because that's where my skill lies. And that is, I want people like Ricky, is that? Yes. To feel comfortable being able to bring out her abilities and talk about them with people. I want, when something like 911 happens, I don't want people saying, damn it, what can we do? I'm angry. I want them to say, there is something I can do. I can sit in my living room and think differently. And that is something that I can do. And it does do something. And I want that to be universally accepted. And so that's why I feel like science has a role, because there are a lot of people who won't accept it unless they see it brought out through the paradigm of Western science. Thank you for joining us in this exploration of the role of mind and matter. Each of these research projects is part of a larger whole, and I hope sometime in the not too distant future that we'll be able to reflect on our contributions, both individually and collectively, to the emergence of a global mind change. ION's research team is currently directing more than 30 noetic research and education projects. Because we're a not-for-profit organization, it's your membership contributions and private donations that are helping to fund these exciting projects. And now, let's hear from our members. My name is Skip Atwater. I'm from Virginia, and I came to the Mind and Matter conference to find out if I minded what mattered. And it turns out that I really do. I've really enjoyed being at the conference, listening to those scientists, those researchers, those people involved in the highest order of understanding this emerging consciousness. I think one of the really exciting things about this weekend has been the, the participants, the 70 or 75 of us here uh, have had a chance to get acquainted. And everyone, uh, all the participants here are interesting people from varied walks of life and who are all on their journeys. Uh, and the thing that really sets apart this group is the open-mindedness. People come here wanting to learn. My name is Charles Mansaker, I'm from Oslo in Norway, and I jumped on this occasion to see the real top scientists in the fields, I knew the names, and not only to listen to the presentations, but to participate in the experiments. I'm John Sweeney from Duxbury, Massachusetts. I came here to the IONS Convention on um, Mind and Matter, basically because I'm a Tongren healer. It's a distance healing technique. Uh, this has been transformative for me. It's a wonderful thing to be in community with people who are like-minded, yet are sufficiently skeptical and scientific so that we get the true information and not a lot of hogwash. Hi, I'm Catherine Darling. I live in Mill Valley and I'm the founder of the Mother Wave Institute. And I've just loved this conference on mind and matter. It's been so full of brain life. The presenters have been so brilliant and the people in the audience have all been luminaries in their own fields. I've had so much fun schmoozing with all the people. And the way the conference has been set up to combine an input of some 
somewhat left brain information with some more right brain interactive communications in the wisdom circles is wonderful. And of course this environment just says it all. Hi, I'm Barbara Arnold. I'm from Hillsboro, California. Uh, I have uh, been to uh, the Noetic Institute before for conferences, but I've never uh, quite uh, been so thoroughly entranced and satisfied, both spiritually and uh, intellectually. My name is Karin Cuter. Um, I'm from Lafayette, California, and um, this whole uh, weekend has really um, far exceeded my expectations. It's been a wonderful opportunity to meet leaders in the field, and I've really enjoyed the people that are here. The um, whole experience has been just really incredible. My name is John Crowley. I live in Petaluma, very local. I found out about ions about a month ago. I didn't really know it existed before. And I suppose I'm a, a skeptic in a, in a sense. I've always kind of believed this, but I need pure science to validate it for me. And some of the experiments and, and the talks that we got this weekend were just fabulous for me. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I'll be back. And, and come and join us.